Welcome to Critical Issues Commentary, the podcast ministry of Gospel of Grace Fellowship, a non-denominational Christian church in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. This is Jessica Kramus, your host for today, and I'm speaking with Bob DeWay, Gospel of Grace's teacher and theologian and author of Critical Issues Commentary. In this series, we have been discussing Dutch Sheets' book, Intercessory Prayer. Last week, we were sharing some passages out of Ezekiel as we had addressed Dutch Sheets' claim that he needs us to release him. Now, as we were closing, you mentioned you had another passage in Ezekiel that you would like to refer to. So why didn't you read that for us? Yes, Ezekiel 18.31, cast away from you all your transgressions, which you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Now, the reason I wanted to look that up is I had cited Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. And you see the similar thing I mentioned last week in uh, Jeremiah, circumcise okay. your heart, I will circumcise your heart. In the end, these things are stated to show us that unless we believe God and his promises and give him the glory, we'll end up in idolatry like everybody else. That's right. And we, we need to also kind of understand compatibilism. Like, yes, God has given us the command to repent and turn to him, but he's also the one who gives us the ability to. So our obedience to him is our response to what he is doing in us. Yes, the real issue is, is there any human merit or any human ability that triggers all of this and makes it happen? And the key places in the Bible, and I've written about this, if you want to go search our site, but the, pe the key people in the Bible are cases of God intervening and giving promises for people that weren't even looking for it. Right. How about Abram in Ur of the Chaldees? Yeah, he was not seeking God. Well, he, didn't, he wasn't looking for a new place to live. Right. God appeared to him tangibly. Yes. Called him. And uh, as I mentioned last week, Saul of Tarsus wasn't looking to become a Christian. He was hostile. And we can even look at, at the disciples as Jesus called them throughout the beginning of his earthly ministry. They right. were mending nets or just going about their normal daily business. They were not seeking Jesus. Yes. Jesus saved them. Right. And we also mentioned the gathering who was sent. Yes. Was because he had something to offer. God needed him. Because if that was the case, how did he get delivered to start with other than God incarnate, Jesus Christ, delivered him? Right and Jairus's daughter and so on. So we, I know that takes, some people just won't allow their thinking to change. Okay. And I know, and I'm not saying, I know that everybody like that's not a Christian because I know Christians who really can't tolerate the idea of monergism, which is salvation is a work of God alone. Okay. Not denying secondary causes, compatibilism means and so on but god would be perfectly just to condemn everyone right but god is also loving and so that's where read the whole counsel of god study spend your time reading all of it yes and we'll get to the right place now um let me read this series we were on page 50 we didn't really get any further yeah. We're in sheets. The producer simply wants to distribute through us. Intercessor wants to intercede through us. Mediator wants to mediate through us. The representative wants to represent through us. The go between wants to go between through us. And so on. It's a whole long series called out. So okay. everything happens through us. But as a matter of fact, the Bible says it's through Jesus Christ, the mediator. Right. 
He's and the mediator and he's the intercessor. We are not. I found my printout. I sent, I did a research through my Logos software of the Greek in the New Testament. And when okay. it comes to the sort of intercession we're talking about, it isn't talking about us being the intercessors. Right. It's about Christ and about the Holy Spirit. This whole book on intercessory prayer is based on a premise that's not valid. Right. In case anyone missed the episode where we discuss these verses, let's just quick review those several verses you had about intercession in the New Testament. Okay. So um, let's look at Romans 8, 27. I have here every time this word for intercession to intercede as a verb is used in the New Testament. ESV, he who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. All right. So the saints don't intercede for the saints. The spirit intercedes for the saints. That's what it says in Romans 8, 27. And by the way, the doctrine of the Trinity is true. Yes. Do not listen to the one is Pentecostals, various heretics out there. We believe in the Trinity. Okay? Yes. The Holy Spirit, God the Spirit, intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. He's not giving a re revelation to some apostle or prophet out there who knows what his will is. He intercedes for us. We don't even know what it's going to take to get us where he wants us to be. Right. Okay? Romans 834. That was Romans 827. Romans 834. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. All right. So, so there no again, are we interceding for us or is Jesus interceding for us? The Holy Spirit is interceding for the saints. Jesus Christ at the right hand of God. That's another allusion to Psalm 110, verse 1, who's interceding okay. for us. Okay, so, yes. so far, the four cases where this is applicable in the New Testament, it's the Holy Spirit and it's the Son of God. Now, here we have a case citing the Old Testament, but it's not exactly what you might think. We've been talking about some of the verses used by Dutch sheets. Romans 11.2 is another case. God okay. has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Okay. So Elijah was saying, how can you put up with these people? Right. They're rebellious. So it's not, it's, it really doesn't fit Dutch sheets view either. But he yes. does have a plan for ethnic national Israel that's yet future. Well, and I think another thing that's important to bring out here is there's a difference between the Old Testament prophets and us. And there's a, a difference between the apostles who were ordained by Christ and us. And Dutch Sheets and other NAR teachers all miss that. And so we can't look at some of these things and say, well, this is how it happened for Elijah. So that's what we need to do. Or this is how it happened for the apostles. So that's what we need to do. That's we aren't apostles and we aren't, um, we aren't Old Testament prophets. Absolutely. Now let's go look at Hebrews 7.25. Last incident of okay. the use of this verb. All right. Hebrews 7.25, citing the ESV. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Okay. Hebrews 7.25. Yes. That's an amazing passage. It sure is. It's an amazing promise. Now, I cited... Romans 8, 27, 
Romans 8.34, and now Hebrews 7.25. Let's ask ourselves a question. Am I more comforted by knowing that Christ carried out his purpose, died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, in order to bring us to God, ascended to heaven. He always lives to make intercession for us. He's able to save to the uttermost, which is include power, time, against anything that might come up, because he intercedes for us. The Holy Spirit's interceding for us, according to the scripture, or am I more comforted by God wants to intercede, but he's going to do it through us? Right. The fact is, so many Christians have been fed human-centered, man-centered theology that would make us think that God really isn't in charge of his own universe. Yes. And, you know, to bring this all back to Dutch Sheet's book, we had just read over a list of claims that he makes. And the last one is the minister of reconciliation has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And he just in parentheses says the second Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. So we'll look at that in just a minute. But then he says, we now represent him in his representation ministry. God continues to incarnate his redemptive purposes in human lives. What exactly does he mean by that? Well, this is another way of diminishing the uniqueness of Christ. Okay. Okay. The incarnation is about the only begotten one. Yes. Unless Dutch Sheets created the entire universe out of nothing, he is not the incarnation of God walking around. Right. And neither am I. All right. So let's look at this, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19, and just see if this backs up his claim. So here's what it says. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Okay, so we see some of the same words, but is the meaning the same? No, because the word of reconciliation is the gospel. Yes. In fact, it says that uh, we're new creatures in Christ, I think right before that. The gospel is a command. Right. I think that's the next passage here. Be reconciled to God. Yes. That's what it says. So I have verse 20 in front of me here. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. I actually preached on that now. A couple months ago, I used that as one of my applications for first yes. Christians. So how can a wicked sinner facing God's wrath, alienated from God, hostile to the gospel, considering Christ crucified either scandalous or foolish, ever be reconciled to God? God has chosen to use the ironically foolish foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. See, God gives specific promises based on what he's done. He's raised okay. Jesus Christ from the dead. Yes. The sinless one, the very creator of the universe, the virgin born son of God is the one, only one who lived a sinless life. The right. only one who demonstrated who he is. The only one on the Mount of Transfiguration, the voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son, listen to him. It doesn't okay. say listen to Moses, listen to him. Moses promised that God would raise up a prophet like Moses, and that when he does, listen to him. So we know that that's Jesus. 
Okay. Yes. He died for sins, a substitutionary death on behalf of sinners. He, ra- he was raised on the third day and shed his blood. Those who trust in him alone, he, he bodily came forth from the grave. No one ever found a body he, before witnesses ascended to heaven. So we're reading these verses about him interceding for us. He paid for yes. our salvation. He intercedes for us. Okay. So the command to be reconciled to God, if addressed to the unsaved, is a command to repent and believe the gospel. All right. Don't trust self. Don't trust religion. Don't trust human ability. Don't trust that I'm going to get revelations or I'm going to go to a meeting where some apostle will pray for me. There are no new apostles in the biblical sense. Paul was the last one. And the last one living, as far as we know, was John, who died in the first century, around 90-something A.D. So they're not going to help you. But be reconciled to God by believing the gospel. Or there's certainly a tinge of irony there, because the Corinthians were supposed to be new creatures in Christ, but some of the things they were believing and doing may call for an ironic rebuke. You're supposed to be new creatures in Christ. Are you reconciled to God? Yes. That would be an ironic rebuke to those who are listening. Or in the gospel context, it means believe in Christ alone. Yes. Okay. So we aren't incarnations. Let's save that term for the one to whom it applies, Christ. Okay, so looking back at Dutch Sheet's book then, on page 54, he makes this claim. So the partnership goes on, God and humans, but the correct pattern is critical. My prayers of intercession release Christ's finished work of intercession. How would you respond to that? That is exactly backwards and false. Okay. He intercedes for us. Yes. Our job is to preach the gospel. Right. Here's what she says is the heavenly pattern. Okay. Jesus is the victor. We are the enforcers. Jesus is the redeemer. We are the releasers. Wow. Wow. This is not biblical. How does someone have the status of a teacher, a leader, or whatever role he has claimed here and understand Christian theology so poorly? Right. This is false. This is not what we're seeing in the Bibles. It's a rejection of Romans 8, 26 through 39. It's a rejection of Hebrews, where we read about the session of Christ at the right hand of the majesty on high, Psalm 110, verse 1, Hebrews 7, 25, he intercedes for us. We don't even know how to pray as we ought, but we trust him. The Bible doesn't tell us to enforce things, it tells us to preach the gospel, to pray for one another, and to trust God and believe his promises. Yes. You know, and kind of as a preview of what we're going to talk about next week, which is going to get a lot into spiritual warfare on page 55, he says plan a is for supernatural, but ordinary people like you and me to one wholeheartedly believe in the victory of Calvary to be convinced that it was complete and final. And two, to rise up in our role as sent ones, ambassadors, authorized representatives of the victor. Our challenge is not so much to liberate as to believe in the liberator, to heal as to, be- to believe in the healer. Now he's kind of, <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of equivocation going on there. Absolutely. And I would have to see whether, I wonder if he's ever, actually taught through one and two Corinthians verse by verse or Romans or Hebrews. I doubt he ever has. 
Yes. Fact, I wonder if C. Peter Wagner or Todd Bentley or any of these people can account for the whole counsel of God. Now, Probably but, not. No, because otherwise they wouldn't call themselves apostles. Yes. They wouldn't claim they're going to do greater miracles than Jesus. I don't know if he would claim that, but that, that group does. The ambassador idea would simply be, if it's applied properly, proclaiming the terms of the gospel. Yes. And every Christian is called to do that. The people are lost. They're alienated from God. They're facing God's wrath. That Jesus Christ died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, and to call people to be reconciled to God. Right. That's, that's what right. we are called to do. Right. But that seems rather humdrum because as we go on, he doesn't like to deal. He has all these stories. Dutch has a, tons of stories. Yes. And he hears God tell him this and that. And we did this and that. And as a matter of fact, the stories are very charming, but utterly worthless. Right. The promises of God cannot fail because God cannot lie. Yep. Our stories may entertain people, but they don't really help. Right. So he ends this chapter with, come on, church, let's untie some folks. Let's tell them there is a God who cares. Let's represent. Let's mediate. Let's intercede. Can no. anyone find the present participator? No, that's wrong. That's not what it says. It's not biblical. Okay. And I know it's the next chapter, we have the prayer walks and all this stuff. If everything depends on us, that Romans 8, 27 to 39 is of no comfort to anyone. Right. So I would like to debate. I wonder if Dutch Sheets wants to defend his position based on sound biblical exegesis, or he just wants to preach to people who are already deceived by what he teaches. Right. And we're going to see in the next chapter, in our next couple of episodes, there are some kind of very concerning and false underlying assumptions in his theology. So as we discuss what actually happened on Calvary, what you and I think happened there is very different than what he thinks happened there. That's not surprising because the word of faith idea is, lies behind a lot of this. We'll, yes. we'll see that. And E.W. Kenyon's teaching is, lurks. It's, it's, right. Uh, Okay, we are out of time for this edition of Critical Issues Commentary Radio. You can access this episode and many others, as well as years worth of articles at the website cicministry.org. While you're there, click on contact and send us a message. We'd love to hear from you. We want to encourage you all to stand firm in one spirit with one mind and strive together for the faith of the gospel. For Critical Issues Commentary, this is Jessica Kramus. And Bob DeWay. We'll see you next week.